Well, good morning. Welcome. Thanks for being here. This is the class Jesus on the Good Life, discussing the Sermon on the Mount from Matthew chapters 5, 6, and 7. So uh, just go ahead and open up your Bibles to Matthew 5 today. And we're going to start by reading verses 1 and 2. And then we'll be flipping around to a lot of other places this morning, so keep your Bible open and ready to flip, or your screen up and ready to plug in different references, whatever you do, if you use one of those abominable devices to read the Bible on. All right, so, uh, so our text is Matthew 5, we'll be just looking at verses 1 and 2. Seeing the crowds, he went up on the mountain, and when he sat down, his disciples came to him, and he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, and we're going to cut off in the middle of a sentence there, Uh, just read that far today. Would you pray with me? Holy Father, we pray that you would uh, bless our church in this beginning of a new Sunday school semester. May we be faithful in teaching your word and in making disciples. And uh, in this class, we pray for your blessing as we listen to our Lord's teachings and as we seek to follow all that he has taught, as we seek to obey and to learn and to grow and to teach others to obey in fulfillment of the mandate he gave us. So may your spirit be with us this morning. To that end, we pray in his name. Amen. Well, come on in, have a seat. So uh, the the title of this class, as you can see, is Jesus on the Good Life. And I wanted to begin simply by raising that question for us uh, concerning what is the good life. And let's begin with a little bit of discussion today of answering that, first of all, from the perspective of, let's say, the average person on the street. If you talk to the average person on the street and you say, what does the good life look like? What characterizes the good life. Uh, what do you think you would hear? A money. money, right. Good job, yeah. What else? Retirement. Retirement. <laughs> okay. Related to wealth. Recreation. Recreation. Family. Health. Okay. Big house. Power. Yes. What else? Happiness. Think of anything else? Prestige, maybe? Uh, Social acceptance, reputation. What about sex? Doesn't money, sex, and power pretty much define everything people are seeking after today? Uh, So, yeah, we we, we have a sense of what, what the world would define or what the average person might define as this is what characterizes the good life. What do you think the Bible says the good life is. We'll be talking about that at length, but what do you think is, uh, is an alternative vision? Th- these things are not bad, right? Maybe a number of these things we would include on a biblical list, but, but what is the difference in perspective when you look at what Scripture teaches? Good. I'll put it this way. <coughs> Knowing God. Knowing God. What's that? Hope. Okay. Serving others. What else? Think of anything else? Freedom. Freedom from what? Okay, yeah. 
Yeah. Anything else? Contentment, yeah. I want to throw out a word that we don't use a lot, but I think we should. Virtue. It's an older word, but a word that refers to character, moral uprightness, the shaping and forming of a, of a person in a properly oriented direction. That's what virtue is. So as we compare these two lists, just take a personal inventory right now, very quickly, and now ask yourself, when I'm on my deathbed, which one of these lists is going to characterize more of what I invested my time, energy, and effort in? The things that I'm doing right now, is it about the one on the left or is it about the one on the right? That's what this Sunday school class will be about. Because I think Jesus gives us a vision of life that is much more along these lines in Matthew 5, 6, and 7. And he shows us a radically different perspective on how to think about what it means to live the good life. Now, notice a lot of the things on this side of the list really have nothing to do with your circumstances. Isn't that interesting? This does. Your circumstances that are outside your control can define the good life from a worldly perspective. This has much more to do with who you are as a person and how you face your circumstances, whatever they may be. And so uh, you could have terrible circumstances in your life uh, from birth till death. You could face one suffering, one trial, one tragedy after another, and still, when it's all said and done, you can look back and say, I lived a good life because I pursued what was most important. So uh, that's the vision that I want us to have, the, uh, the desire I want us to have, from, from this class and from all that we do together as a church is to think about how do we form ourselves into the virtuous people, not how do we form ourselves, how do, how do we pursue God's method of forming us uh, into the virtuous people that he has designed us to be. Because I think ultimately the good life is about that very issue, the design that God has for us. If God has designed humanity to work a certain way, then it stands to reason that working that way is what constitutes goodness. Uh, if you have a, a car that's designed to run a certain way, it's a good car if it does what it's supposed to do, if it does what the designer uh, designed it to do. If you as a human being love God and love other people and embody the kind of life that is demonstrated in Matthew 5, 6, and 7, you are living according to what God designed you to do. And that's why I would, would argue that, that ethics, the study of what is right and what is wrong, is ultimately about purpose. It's ultimately about what was God's purpose in, uh, in making us human. And so Jesus tells us quite a bit about this in, uh, in these three chapters. So I would argue you really cannot find a more sublime collection of teachings on what does it mean to live the virtuous life than in these three chapters of the New Testament, Matthew 5, 6, and 7. We're only going to introduce them today and look at some themes that rise up throughout the Scripture and try to set this sermon in a broader biblical context. And in order to do that, I'm going to ask three questions that are going to uh, guide us through our study today. So the first question is going to be, why on a mountain... In Galilee, why do we get this sermon, this body of teaching on a mountain in Galilee in Matthew's gospel? Number two, uh, what is the sermon about? I'll try to give you an overview so that uh, you can read it yourself, study it yourself, meditate it. Whoops, why did I say God? What is the sermon about? 
I was, I was thinking the word guide. I think it will guide you through the, the reading of it. What is the sermon about? And then three, um, what was Jesus' purpose in this sermon? Why on a mountain in Galilee? What is it about? What was Jesus' purpose in giving uh, the, these instructions? Let's address that first question. Why does Matthew tell us this story of Jesus going up on a mountain, his disciples coming to him, and him delivering this teaching? Mountains factor prominently in the Bible. Can you think of another example of a mountain story? In Scripture, there's a lot of them, but but what's an example? Probably the most famous. Yeah, Moses at Mount Sinai. If you have have Israel being gathered together at Mount Sinai, Moses goes up the mountain to receive the tablets of the law covenant and the instructions for the tabernacle, and he delivers those to Israel. Uh, Did you know that the temple in Jerusalem was built on an elevated place that is called uh, Mount Zion? And so there's another significant point in Scripture that is an an elevated location called a mountain. You may not think of this one, but did you know the Garden of Eden seems to be pictured as a mountain, or at least located on a mountain? Um, You do have reference in Genesis 2 to uh, a river that watered the garden, and then it mentions it broke into four rivers, and those four rivers go out and water the rest of the earth. Well, the it would stand to reason that if it's the source of water that goes to the rest of the earth, it must be in higher in elevation. But it seems to be confirmed for us in Ezekiel. If you want to turn to Ezekiel 28. Ezekiel 28. Look at verse 13. Some have argued that Ezekiel 28, 13, uh, this, this section is about the fall of Satan. And uh, that's a possible reading. That may not be the correct reading. It may be a dramatic picture or image simply of a human king, the king of Tyre. But uh, whatever the passage means, it certainly gives us insight into the nature of the Garden of Eden. Because notice verse 13 and 14. It says, You were in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was your covering, sardius, topaz, and diamond, beryl, onyx, and jasper, sapphire, emerald, and carbuncle. And crafted in gold were your settings and your engravings. On the day that you were created, they were prepared. You were an anointed guardian cherub. I placed you. You were on the holy mountain of God. In the midst of the stones of fire, you walked. The holy mountain of God seems to be a way of picturing the Garden of Eden uh, based on the parallel of verses 13 and 14. Now, what is it that we see in common with these three references to Sinai, to Mount Zion, even to the Garden of Eden? And you could multiply other references as well throughout Scripture. What is the significance of mountains in all of these stories or all of these references? Well, it seems to be that the mountain, in each case, is the intersection of heaven and earth. It's the place where God meets with his people. So think of Adam in the garden. Adam is walking in the very presence of God on earth, but heaven and earth are meeting there. Or Israel at Mount Sinai. Now Israel stays at the foot of the mountain. They don't dare go into God's presence, but Moses the mediator is allowed to go into the intersection of heaven and earth. Uh, up, at, up Mount Sinai where he receives the law of God. Or Israel meeting God at Mount Zion. Again, they can't go in the temple. But there, at that holy place where the Spirit of God has filled the temple with the glory cloud, that is the intersection of heaven and earth, the place where God meets with his people. It seems as though God designed mountains to teach us that. Because mountains are, uh, in our human perspective, elevated high places. They communicate transcendence and permanence and stability, and they're, they're fitting images of, uh, of God's dwelling place among us, the, the opportunity to meet with God. 
So um, it seems that, that Matthew is repeating the same theme in his gospel when he mentions Jesus going up on a mountain to deliver this testimony. He's telling us God is meeting with his people in a very significant place in history. But that raises the question, why this mountain? Why a mountain in Galilee? Uh, we don't know exactly what mountain this was, but it's, it is taking place during Jesus' Galilean ministry, the early part of Jesus' Galilean ministry, apparently. Galilee was a region uh, up in the north of Israel. Judea is down in the south. Between them, you have Samaria. So you've got Galilee in the north, Samaria, and then Judea. And down in the south in Judea is where the city of Jerusalem is located. And that's where the temple was. That's where the, the major cultural center was. That's where uh, the history was. That's where the power was. Jerusalem. Jesus, at this time in his ministry, is not in Jerusalem. And he's not delivering this from Mount Zion. Why not? Well, Matthew makes a big deal of Galilee throughout his gospel. Look back with me, if you're back in Matthew 5, look back to chapter 4, verses 12 to 17. Chapter 4, verse 12 says, Now when he heard that John had been arrested, he withdrew into Galilee, and leaving Nazareth, he went and lived in Capernaum by the sea in the territory of Zebulun and Naphtali, so that what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled. The land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali by the way of the sea, the way of the sea beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles. The people dwelling in darkness have seen a great light, and for those dwelling in the region and the shadow of death, on them a light has dawned. From that time Jesus began to preach, saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Jesus preaches among the Galileans, and he's doing so in fulfillment of Isaiah 9, 1 and 2, which speaks of Galilee of the Gentiles and this light shining on a people in darkness. But then that just raises the question, why did Isaiah prophesy that? What's the significance of Isaiah prophesying a Galilean light in uh, Isaiah chapter 9? Notice uh, also in Matthew's gospel, Jesus has two other major mountain events that happen in Galilee. You can just write these down. We won't read them. But if you look at Matthew 17, 1 and following, Jesus is, is in Galilee. He goes up a mountain with Peter, James, and John, and he's transfigured before them so that he reveals his divine glory on a mountain in Galilee. And then at the very end of the gospel, the resurrection of Jesus is announced, but Matthew doesn't record any appearances of Jesus in Jerusalem. We know there were appearances in Jerusalem from Luke and from John, uh, but Matthew doesn't record any of them. Matthew pictures the disciples going to Galilee, to the mountain that Jesus told them. And they meet him there on the mountain in uh, Matthew 28, verse 16. And there he gives them his final command. Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. And behold, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. You have very prominent theme of mountains in Galilee throughout uh, Matthew. In addition, you have a very prominent theme in all four Gospels, but especially in Matthew, of Jesus against Jerusalem. Jesus versus Jerusalem. So uh, I'll just give you the references here. You can write them down. Matthew 21, 12 and 13. Jesus cleanses the temple in Jerusalem. And, and he calls out the leadership of the temple and says that they've made it into a den of thieves. But it's supposed to be a house of prayer. So the temple's corrupt. And Jesus cleanses it. Uh, in the same context, 21, 18 and 19, Jesus curses a fig tree which appeared to be producing fruit from a distance, but when you get up close, you realize there's nothing of substance there, nothing of substance there. And, and so it's a, a fitting image of Jerusalem and the temple that it seems that there's so much life, and yet you get up close and look at it, and it's dead. And Jesus curses it as an image of what's going to happen to Jerusalem and the temple. Uh, in 21, 33 to 44, he gives the parable of the tenants, who uh, a, a, an owner of a vineyard, leased it out to tenants, uh, or, or he allowed these tenants to take care of it, but they, 
they would never give him his return, and he kept sending servants, and they kept beating the servants and rejecting them. Finally, he sent his own son. They killed his son. And, uh, and so uh, the point is that the master of that vineyard is going to come, and, uh, and he's going to, to put to death those who have abused his vineyard and his servants and killed his son. So uh, the punchline is in Matthew 21, 43, where Jesus tells the leadership in Jerusalem, Therefore I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people producing its fruits. Chapter 23, the whole chapter, if you just read it, is a pronunciation of curses on the leadership of Israel. And it culminates with a lament over the city of Jerusalem. Chapter 24, Jesus tells his disciples that one day, this temple that you're looking at, this magnificent structure, and it was magnificent. Uh, Herod had had, uh, renovated the temple in such a way that it was much larger even than the first temple and much more glorious. Jesus says, not one stone will be left on another. And he tells them that within your lifetime, this temple will be gone. So there's this prominent theme throughout this gospel of Jesus against Jerusalem. Now, I want to tie these two things together here. Jesus is ministering in Galilee, and he's pronouncing woe, judgment, curse on the leadership of Jerusalem throughout this gospel. What is the point here? The point is that the old covenant era is coming to an end. The era of the the time when God's presence would be mediated through this nation, through this temple, and through this covenantal structure that's tied up with it, this priesthood, all of that is about to come to an end. And Jesus is now gathering to himself the people of the new covenant. He's gathering to himself what we would call the true Israel, the true people of God who are going to be faithful to him in contrast to the current leadership of Israel in Jerusalem and the current leadership of the temple. The temple's days are numbered. Mount Zion's days are numbered. The earthly Mount Zion. And Jesus gathers disciples to himself on a remote mountain in Galilee among the backwoods redneck people of his day in order to say this is what the new covenant community is going to look like. It's not going to be made up of the elite It's not going to be a meritocracy. The grace of God is going to go out indiscriminately, and it's going to draw people in from all nations. And my true new covenant people will be built and organized around me. The true temple of God is going to have a presence in this world. So the type is giving way to reality. And I think that's the significance of the mountain. That's the significance of the mountain's location, specifically in Galilee. And if we see ourselves in that story, we can understand why then the teachings of a Jewish rabbi 2,000 years ago in an obscure location still resonate for us today and still matter for our lives because we are part of that community. We are part of that temple that God is building. And this word that Jesus gives us is to be the order of our lives as well. So with that said, what then is the sermon about What is the main point that Jesus is making? Jesus talks more about the kingdom of heaven than of any other subject in Matthew. The kingdom of heaven. And that is the main subject that comes up throughout the sermon as well. Um, I hesitate to to read all the references, but I'll mention them. I've already read chapter 4, verse 17, if you want to write these down. 4.17, it summarizes Jesus' preaching as repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. In chapter 5, verse 3 and verse 10, so at the beginning of the Beatitudes, you know what the Beatitudes are, the blessed statements? At the beginning of the Beatitudes, Jesus says, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. At the end, so at the beginning and end, including inclusio is what they call that, enveloping, the the two ends of that section, he says, blessed are those 
who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. He, he reiterates that same point again in verse 10. If you look at uh, chapter 5, verses 17 to 20, which is um, really the thematic statement for the whole sermon about how Jesus relates to the law and the prophets, he mentions the kingdom of heaven at least uh, two or three times in those verses. At the heart of his model prayer in chapter 6, verse 10, is the request to God, your kingdom come. Jesus tells us in chapter 6, verse 33, seek first uh, the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. And then at the end of the sermon, at a key juncture, uh, when he's giving, a call it his invitation at the end, he mentions that there will be a number of people who call him Lord and yet do not ultimately enter the kingdom. So this comes up at strategic points throughout the sermon, indicating this is, in, in line with the rest of the gospel, what the sermon is about. Now that, that raises the question, what then should we say the kingdom of heaven is? How do we define it? Is it a kingdom that concerns, it, it kind of sounds like it, kingdom of heaven, it, it sounds like it concerns a faraway place and perhaps a distant future, something that's far removed from life now. This is, this is the real world, and Jesus may be talking about pie in the sky, right? That's not at all the picture you get, though, when you read what Jesus says about the kingdom. He's calling people to repent in chapter 4, verse 17, just as John the Baptist had done. He's calling them to repent because the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now think back to the Garden of Eden as we try to define this concept of the kingdom of heaven. Think back to the Garden of Eden. God's rule over his creation before the fall was mediated by human beings who were made to bear his image. That is, human beings, the very design of humanity is to represent God. And our rule over creation is such that we were created to be priest kings in God's holy temple, to be those who, who serve in the holy place and those who cultivate, develop a world, uh, and bring it into submission to him in order to, to honor his name, to lift him up, to praise him, to be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it as his image bearers. That's the original image of the kingdom. God's rule over creation mediated through humanity properly related to him. Now, we know how the story goes, though. In Genesis 3, the serpent seizes control. Humanity abdicates its place in the, the, the role that it's been given as God's representative. Humanity rebels against God, and the serpent seizes control as humanity is exiled from the presence of God. So I believe, for example, in the temptations of Jesus, when Satan says to Jesus, uh, if you will bow down and worship me, I'll give you all the kingdoms of the world because they've been given to me. I don't think Satan was lying. He is a liar, but I don't think he was lying on that occasion. I think that was a, a real temptation, a real offer that he had to, to, to put out there. He is called the God of this world. Uh, he's called the ruler of this age, the, the prince of the power of the air. He is the one who has usurped authority in this age. Now, I want to be very careful the way we think about that. I don't mean, of course, that God's sovereignty over his world has in any way been compromised. God is absolutely sovereign entirely in all things. Uh, there's nothing, in that sense, there's nothing that happens outside of his will. Uh, his authority, in that sense, has not been taken from him. But you might think of it this way. If, if, if you think of a, an author writing a book, the author is always in control of the story. But the author may have his characters uh, on their plane of action uh, have turmoil and upheaval. So let's say, let's say the author writes a story with a character that represents himself ruling over a kingdom. And that character's authority is taken from him, is usurped. And, uh, and an evil villain has taken over the kingdom. That's the situation we're in. The author is still writing the story, but his kingdom within the story has been usurped. And so what's going to happen then in this story is the author's going to write himself into it as a character, and he is going to take back the throne of the kingdom that was taken. 
from his hero. That's how this works. God's general sovereignty is never compromised, but on the plane of action here, Satan has indeed seized control of the kings of this world. And so when Jesus comes announcing that the kingdom of heaven is at hand, what he means is God is about to reestablish his rule for humanity. The last Adam has shown up. And he's ready to take his throne back. And at that point, the the head of the serpent will be crushed. And God's glorious purpose for creation, as he originally designed it, will then be brought to fulfillment. So the kingdom of heaven, why then call it the kingdom of heaven if it's really about earth? Well, I think it's because heaven is the realm from which it comes to us. It It is the kingdom from above that then comes to us here. The kingdom that that is not of this world doesn't arise from the forces of this world or the political process of this world. It is an invasion from another world. And in invading this world, the kingdom of heaven completely reorients the way we think and the way we live. So what the, the, the interesting dynamic of the New Testament is, is that the kingdom through Jesus Christ has already begun. He has died and he's been raised from the dead. He's been enthroned. Did you know what the most quoted verse from the Old Testament in the New Testament is? Psalm 110, verse 1. The Lord said to my Lord, so so Yahweh God said to the Messiah, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. That verse is quoted more than any other verse in reference to Jesus in the New Testament as a way of indicating He's on the throne now. He's been enthroned at the right hand of God by his death and resurrection. Therefore, the kingdom has been established, and yet the, the, the wrinkle in it all, if you want to call it that, his kingdom is not manifested yet. It's not publicly revealed. It's, a, it's kind of like a big secret at this point. Now, the church exists to be an embassy of that kingdom, to make that kingdom visible in this age through our life together. And yet we, we cannot, uh, obviously as the church, we can't show the fullness of what that kingdom is. We can't, uh, we can't coercively defeat the enemies of God, for example. We, we exist alongside them in this age. And so we're an embassy, we're an outpost, we're a foretaste, but the reality is still to come when Christ returns, when the judgment comes, when the creation is purged of all evil. And if that's the case, what it means is we live in two ages at once. We already live in the kingdom in one sense. Christ has been raised. The new age has begun. The kingdom has begun. The Holy Spirit is given to us as the first fruits of that coming age. And yet we continue to live in a world that is fallen and sinful and full of death and suffering and evil. And that's why the Sermon on the Mount matters so much, because it shows us how to live. In this age, I would say the whole point of the sermon is how to live a heavenly life on earth. If you want to put it that way, how to live a heavenly life on earth. So then I want to give you quickly an, an overview of what the whole sermon's about, and hopefully this will aid in your own reading of it and your personal study. So um, it begins, I'll just give you the outline here. It begins with uh, an introduction, which is about the character and influence of Jesus' disciples. The character and influence of Jesus' disciples, that's in 5, 3 to 16. So the section that covers the Beatitudes and then the what's called the similitudes. The character and influence of Jesus' disciples. Two, the law of Moses and Jesus' disciples. How do we relate to the law of Moses? And that's in uh, 5, 17 to 48, or the rest of chapter 5. So if you think of all of chapter 5 as these two sections. And then a third section, the piety 
of Jesus' disciples. That's in uh, 6, 1 to 18. Piety, the piety. Does anybody know that word piety? That's another old word we don't use a lot. It speaks of devotional practices, godly practices. Uh, so piety in Jesus' day for, the, for Jews, first century practitioners of Judaism, was defined by three main practices of, of uh, giving to the poor, prayer, and fasting. And then Jesus goes through those three called pillars of Judaism, and he, um, he shows this is how you as my disciples are to practice these things. Then we have the perspective, in the rest of chapter 6, the perspective of Jesus' disciples, where he, he uh, teaches about wealth and, uh, and necessities and how we as his disciples are to relate to uh, questions of money, possessions, basic necessities. So that's the perspective of Jesus' disciples. And then the fifth section, getting into chapter 7, the relationships of Jesus' disciples. That's in uh, 7, 1 to 12. He talks about how do you relate to uh, your brother and his sin when you have sin in your own life? How are you supposed to deal with that? How do you deal with people who are completely hardened to the truth of the gospel? How do you relate to your heavenly father in prayer? And then to conclude the main body of the sermon, how do you relate to your neighbor in general? So uh, I think that section is, is well def uh, described as relationships. And then uh, at the end of the sermon, the conclusion, Jesus gives us two ways to live. And that's in uh, 7, 13 through 27. Two ways to live. And he gives several images of these two ways to live. Two gates and roads. Uh, two different kinds of trees that represent teachers or prophets. Uh, he mentions uh, a, a confession of faith but doesn't result in entering the kingdom. So two different kinds of confessors. And then at the end, two different foundations to build your house on. I remember as a, as a child learning that song, the wise man built his house upon the rock. The wise man built his house. You know that. That's, that's from the Sermon on the Mount. That's the end of the sermon. And that's Jesus speaking of two ways to live here. All right, then let me conclude this morning, and then we'll, we'll see if we have time for questions. Just very briefly here, what was Jesus' purpose? in giving this sermon. My argument is Jesus taught these things with the expectation that we would obey them. Now the reason I feel compelled to say that is because there are some who have argued he didn't do that. Um, there's, there's a couple of views that I think miss the mark here. There's one view that would argue that the Sermon on the Mount is primarily about a future time. It's about uh, a coming age in the future, uh, which, is, which is referred to in this view as the millennial kingdom, when Jesus will return to earth and he will establish a Jewish kingdom on earth. And uh, in that Jewish kingdom, then the Sermon on the Mount will be directly relevant, but it's not so much as relevant. It may, there may be some ways that it applies to us, but it's, it's not so much relevant to the age of the church. So this is, this is a, a form of what's called dispensationalism. Not all dispensationalists hold that view, but this is a form of that view that would say it's not directly applicable to us today. My response to that view is I think it's simply a bad understanding of what Jesus means by the kingdom of heaven. Uh, they would argue, that the dispensational view would argue that the kingdom of heaven was postponed. Jesus offered it to Israel, but, but upon Israel's rejection, it was postponed and it will be reestablished at some point in the future when all this will then become relevant. I don't think at all that's the way that this passage or the Gospel of Matthew presents it. As I argued earlier, 
I believe that you have so many themes coming up in Matthew that this is for the new covenant people and that the new covenant people are being established now in Jesus' ministry and ultimately through his death and resurrection that we are to read these words as for us directly. Now, there are obviously some cultural references that don't make sense to us anymore. Uh, he mentions if you're offering your gift at the altar and you, you, you think your brother has something against you, you know, leave your gift and go. We don't do that today. Uh, in fact, that's an old covenant practice, but he's speaking in an old covenant age, and yet he's at the overlap of the, the two covenants where the old covenant era is passing away and the new covenant is, uh, is coming into establishment. So I, I think that, that the, the older dispensational view misses the mark there. And then another way of reading this some have argued that its purpose is to show us how sinful we are by giving us God's high standards and exposing our sin so that we know how much we need His grace. And that's the purpose. Now, I don't disagree that that can be a positive effect of reading this sermon. If you read this sermon, you hear it, and you, you think to yourself, my goodness, I see my sin more clearly. I need God's grace. That's a good thing. I don't think, though, that the purpose ends there. Uh, in other words, that view would argue that this sermon is law as opposed to gospel. It, it is only law and not gospel. And so as law, it's intended to kill so that something else, the gospel, can make us alive. I don't read it that way, however, because I think that the law-gospel dynamic in the Scripture is tied to the covenants. The old covenant of law... Is specifically, uh, it specifically has that function of killing or, or, or slaying the flesh or, or convicting us of sin because it was given to an unregenerate people, people who were by and large unable to keep it. So the law at Mount Sinai was given to Israel to expose their sin because at that era in history, they were by and large unregenerate, unrenewed, unsaved people who could not obey God, and the law exposed that. And in exposing Israel, it exposed all of us as, um, as lawbreakers. And it points us to our need for Christ. I don't think the Sermon on the Mount's moving in the same orbit. I think this sermon is intended for those who have been made new, those who now belong to the new covenant, those who've been gathered to Jesus, who, who, for whom the, the law's slaying work has, in a sense, already been done. And now we're being guided in how to walk in righteousness as the new covenant people of God. It's interesting that if you read the law, you read, read from the old covenant, for example, read the book of Deuteronomy chapter 28. I won't go back there today, but um, if you read it, it's the section where the blessings and the curses are laid out. Uh, and it argues that, that if you obey my voice, you will be blessed. Verses, verses 1 to 14 of Deuteronomy 28 say, you'll be blessed when you rise up, blessed when you lie down. You'll be blessed in the field, you'll be blessed in your house. It, it gives this comprehensive vision of blessing for your whole life if you obey God, Israel. And it lasts for 14 verses. Then in verse 15 and following, it says, but if you disobey, you will be cursed. And it goes on. You'll be cursed when you rise up, when you lie down. You'll be cursed in the field, you'll be cursed in the house, you your, your wombs will bear no fruit, your, your fields will bear no crops, you know, all this. And it goes on, <laughs> and it goes on, and it goes on, and it goes on, and it goes on, and it gets into very vivid description of curse, even to the point that your enemies will surround your city so that there, there will be no food, and, and mothers will be eating their own children to survive. That's how bad it gets. And it goes on from verse 15 to verse 68. So in other words, you've got... You got the blessing here, and then you got the curse section here. There's, there's a point there. God is, is telling Israel, here's a preview of things to come because you're not going to obey this. It's interesting if you contrast the blessing curse formula of the Mosaic Covenant with Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount, because what does he do in the Beatitudes? He gives only blessing. There is no curse. Now, I do have to give this caveat because you may look at Luke chapter 6 and say, but he does say woe in, in Luke. He gives blessed and woe. But he's speaking to two different groups in Luke's gospel. He's not saying, you'll be blessed if you obey, curse if you don't. He's saying, you are the ones who are blessed, and you over here who are outside my covenant people, you are the ones who are cursed. So 
Jesus, in giving this new covenant instruction, he's giving only blessing. Because in Christ, there is no curse for us to face. And that's a mark of the new era in covenant history that we're in. That we have been given the blessing of God. We've been given new hearts. We've been forgiven of our sins. And we can, in fact, live in obedience to what Jesus has taught. Now, he does say at one point in the sermon, chapter 5, verse 48, You therefore must be perfect, as your heavenly Father is perfect. We're not going to be perfect in this age. But that is the standard toward which Jesus commands us to aim. And so I, I wouldn't say we should view this as law as opposed to gospel. It's, it's given in the new era of the gospel, and Jesus intends us to obey it. Look at chapter 7, verse 24. At the end of the sermon, Jesus says, Everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. He's expecting us to do these things. He's expecting us to obey. And he's presenting uh, an image of the final judgment that will come when our whole lives, in a sense, will be called to account. Uh, and we'll get to that passage in time, of course, and talk about what it means. Now, where do we go from here? Uh, I would just like to exhort you to, to make it a habit of reading this sermon uh, regularly throughout this semester. Uh, read it beginning to end in one sitting if you can. Uh, probably take you about 10 minutes or so, 10, 15 minutes, but read it beginning to end at first. Try to get the whole picture and take it in. Maybe even do that a few times so that you can see the whole picture. Have this outline handy to, to be a guide to you as you read. But read it as a big picture, then start focusing in on particular chunks and read those more slowly and carefully. Um, and then even proceed to... to units within those chunks and, and learn how to meditate on the scripture if you don't make that a practice yet. Learn how to, to sit quietly for a good while, if you, you know, however much time you can fit into your life, but um, maybe, maybe one of the things about this sermon is as we pursue the good life, we need to, to build in the structures that can make it possible for us to sit before God quietly on a daily basis and listen to Him. And one of the ways we do that is by meditating and by by taking just, say, a verse, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven, and just going through each word in that verse and highlighting it in our mind. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. What does that mean to be blessed? And then think through this idea of blessing. Blessed are the poor in spirit. What does that phrase, poor in spirit, seem to suggest? Think about that deeply. Or get, get you a commentary uh, if, you, if you need one, or, or look up some extra resources or something to help you meditate. But pour over these things. Spend some time thinking deeply about these things as we go through them this semester. If you want to make the Sermon on the Mount the focus of your uh, personal Bible study time this semester, I think that would be a great practice. That's what I'm doing uh, right now. So I encourage you, if, if that is something you'd like to do as well, that could be very helpful. But you have to have a plan to do it. If you If you... Wait for inspiration, it won't come. It may come like one or two days a month, but other than that, you have to, be, you have to plan for it. You have to just say, uh, I am going to, in fact, it would be great for you to just write this down somewhere. I will read from the Sermon on the Mount daily at time, at place. So that you already have in your mind, at this time, at this place, every day, this is when I'm going to sit down and I'm going to read from the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, make that a habit. Make that a habit not only with a sermon, but with daily Bible reading. It can do wonders for you. And uh, see yourself in what Jesus is saying. If you're trusting in Christ, see yourself as a citizen of the kingdom that he is talking about and as one, therefore, who's called to live a heavenly life here on earth. So uh, we've got a little bit of time, maybe, maybe a couple minutes. Does anybody have any questions or thoughts this morning before we go? Yes. Yeah. 
That's a good point. So Esau is the premier example of that. He forfeits his birthright. And yet that's an image of what humanity did in the garden. We forfeited our right to dwell in the presence of God and to flourish according to his design, to, to live a virtuous life in his presence, ruling over his world. And Jesus has come to, to give it back to us. That's a good, good image. Anything else? Well, just a preview then of what's coming up. In two weeks, we're going to look at all of 5, 3 to 16, so the Beatitudes and the similitudes. That's in two weeks. Uh, every fall, this happens. This is just the nature of the calendar. We get rolling in Sunday school, and then we have a Labor Day weekend the next week. So with Labor Day coming next week, all of our adult classes will meet together in the sanctuary next Sunday morning at 9. Please come. Uh, it's still important to come, but... But we'll, we'll be all together next Sunday. We imagine a lot of our folks will be out of town. Uh, but if you're here, please come and go to the sanctuary. We're going to have Logan T. Smith giving a sermon next Sunday morning. Uh, Logan T. is one of our, our young guys, uh, former interns, who is getting ready to go up to New York to be part of our church planting and or revitalization efforts that are going on up there. So if you come and, and offer what I call the ministry of listening to Logan, it will be a rich blessing to him because he's preparing to do this more and more frequently in the future, and so it's helpful for us to be an audience, but it's also going to be helpful for us because he is going to, to labor diligently to prepare and to proclaim a good word to us. So that will be next Sunday, and then the following Sunday we'll be back in here at 9 to talk about Matthew 5, 3 to 16. All right, thanks for being here. You're dismissed.